And now I am really delighted to welcome someone who is a press colleague and friend. Tom Jelton is the correspondent for National Public Radio. Tom joined NPR in 1982 and is a distinguished war reporter and author. He has covered wars front line in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, Colombia, Croatia, and Bosnia. He reported live from the Pentagon on September 11, 2001, and has led regularly NPR's coverage of Afghanistan and during the invasion of Iraq. Let me welcome Tom Jelton to the stage. Thank you very much, Barbara. We do go back a ways. It's been a while since I've reported regularly from the Pentagon, but those of us who were there on the morning of 9-11 share that bond. Uh, it was a morning we'll never forget, was it, Barbara? I'll say right off now how honored I am to be here with you and to call attention to the important work that you do on behalf of our veterans. I'm very impressed by especially all of you lawyers who have given so much of your time and your legal expertise uh, in service of a very important cause. I did cover the first couple of years of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq from the Pentagon. I've not been on the front lines in those countries, uh, so I can't say I know the combat experience that our Iraq and Afghanistan veterans have been through, except vicariously. My wife, Martha Raditz, uh, has been to the war zones dozens of times, as some of you may know, and she wrote a wonderful best-selling book tying the frontline experience with the experience of soldier families back home. So through her, I know something about what veterans have gone through. And as Barbara said, I have done some war reporting of my own years ago in Central America and then in the former Yugoslavia. And one of the things that I've seen in my own reporting experience is that we are much better at focusing on the fighting of a war than on the aftermath of war. I've seen this from a journalist perspective. In Central America, uh, back in the 1980s, I was one of just two foreign correspondents on the NPR staff. Uh, we were just getting started at those years with our foreign coverage. The other position was in the Middle East. Uh, that tells you where our attention was focused back in those days. Central America uh, was one of just two regions in the world that warranted a full-time correspondent. Uh, and what happened? Well, in the space of a few months in 1990, the wars in El Salvador and Nicaragua both ended. New elections, a decade of war in Central America was over. And guess what? NPR pulled me out. We totally shut down our Latin America coverage. I was transferred instead to Berlin. The Berlin Wall had just come down, then we had the first Gulf War, and then the wars in the former Yugoslavia. No more stories from Latin America, zero. Not by me, not by anyone. And NPR was not alone in Sarajevo. I ran into about half of my old war reporting colleagues from Central America. Basically, every news organization had shut down coverage of Latin America and shifted those resources to Eastern Europe, to the former Yugoslavia in particular. And that was my focus for the next several years. And then what happened? We got the Dayton Peace Accords, and that war was over and I left. My last trip to Bosnia was 15 years ago. Our coverage dropped off just like it did after the wars in Central America ended. But it's not as though those stories ended there. In 1996, I went back to El Salvador and Nicaragua. I returned to the war zones, the same war zones where I had spent many months, a decade earlier. What did I find? The peasants who had fought on the side of the Sandinistas and those who had fought on the side of the Contras were as poor as ever. They had been forgotten by their patrons. There was no help from the United States. They actually had made peace with each other, but largely because they shared this common fate. Some had even turned to banditry. Why? Because they had known a lot about guns but not about anything else. I interviewed one former Contra on that trip back in 1996. He came from a campesino family, but had left home at age 13 to fight with the Contra army. So he never learned to plant corn or herd livestock. When the war concluded, 
he was basically useless. He had lost one arm in combat and had no opportunities to farm anyway. So what did he do? He did the one thing he knew how to do. He took up arms again and started roving the countryside with a gang of former Sandinista soldiers and former Contras, now working together as bandits in the countryside. That is the kind of thing that happens in the aftermath of war. But we don't hear those stories because we don't pay attention to the aftermath of war. The same thing with Bosnia. The fighting ended there, as I say, 17 years ago. How many of you know what happened in Bosnia after the Dayton Accords? Well, one of the things that happened is some of the foreign Muslims to fight with the government forces there against the Serbs, stayed in the country while the United States and Europe basically lost interest in the place. And pretty soon there were jihadists in Bosnia. We didn't know much about it, basically because we weren't there anymore. We pretty much forgot about Bosnia, just like we forgot about Central America. So these were some of the things on my mind as I prepared for this event tonight. I doubt you deal or have had much experience with veterans whose war experience states to Central America or the former Yugoslavia, but we can see parallels. What the, all these situations have in common is this issue of the aftermath of war. We are out of Iraq now. We are rapidly winding down in Afghanistan. We'll be out by 2014. But as you all know, we are going to be dealing with the aftermath of those wars for years and years and years. And nowhere will that be more apparent than in the lives and experience of the men and women who fought there. The suffering and hardships and life crises that are certain to afflict many of our veterans will be the aftermath of those wars. And I already know that veteran experiences will not get the attention they deserve. I greatly fear our focus will shift elsewhere. The wars will be behind us. We'll be focused on what we can do with the peace dividend, how we can spend those billions of dollars that had been going to Iraq and Afghanistan. Our leaders in Congress and in the administration are already counting on those big savings, aren't they? It's going to take a huge effort to get Americans to keep veterans in mind, not just now, but 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. And I don't need to tell you how much assistance our veterans will need over this time. On the 10th anniversary of the war in Afghanistan, the Pew Research Center carried out a survey of military veterans, including a big sample of those who served on active duty after 9-11. The findings were sobering. 44%, 44% of those who served after say their readjustment to civilian life has been difficult. 48% of those who served in the active military after 9-11 48% say they've experienced strains in their family relations. Of those who served in combat, 49%, almost half, 49% say they have suffered from post-traumatic stress. Now these figures are much higher than they were for veterans from previous eras. That same survey also looked at the American civilian population. It found that more than 90% of those responding express pride in their troops. That's good, but a plurality, 45%, say neither the war in Iraq nor the war in Afghanistan was worth fighting. And we have just come through a campaign season where it seemed that neither candidate really wanted to talk about those wars. President Obama emphasized that he had ended the war in Iraq and is bringing troops home from Afghanistan. Mitt Romney didn't mention the wars in his convention acceptance speech. They're thinking, unfortunately, they're probably right, they were thinking that the American people may not want to hear much more about these wars. And that Pew survey bears them out. Only about one quarter of the civilians interviewed said they were following war news closely, and half Half of the civilians interviewed said the wars had made little difference in their lives. That's what you're up against. What this means is it's going to take a real effort to keep veteran needs high on the nation's priorities. All the attention right now is on what programs we can cut to deal with the fiscal crisis and the debt. Never before have veterans needed someone more to advocate for them. 
Never before has there been such a need for a group like the National Veterans Legal Services Program. Assistance is available for our veterans, but they need help applying for it. They need help pressing for it. They need help getting it. Treatment for PTS and traumatic brain injury. Health care, cutting through the red tape just to get a doctor's appointment. To get the disability benefits and the health care that they've been promised. Just finally, using. And it's not just a matter of calling up some number at the Veterans Administration to get help. Veterans need help in their own communities. In some cases, as you very well know, they need specialized help from lawyers. And their families need help, particularly those who have lost someone. The wives, husbands, parents, children, many of whom may not be familiar with the military and may not know what survivor benefits are available. I'm actually not going to trash the VA. I think there are good and dedicated people there who care about veterans, but it is a bureaucracy like any other, and bureaucracies don't always work that efficiently. I would say that the Veterans Administration depends on organizations like the NVLSB in order to do its job. And as time goes by, the advocacy work will become all the more important and all the more challenging because people forget, politicians forget, Government turns its attention elsewhere. The, bureauc the bureaucratic machinery becomes even less responsive. But veteran needs will only become greater. They'll require ongoing medical treatment. Some conditions will aggravate as time goes by. The stress will not go away. Family problems can surface years down the road. And meanwhile, remember, half the population, half the American population say the war has made little difference in their lives. How easy it will be for people to forget those whose war experiences linger and hurt. Will we as a nation care for those who return injured from battle? Whether and how we do will show who we are. And with that, I'm going to introduce a video that shares the stories of three veterans who went to war and served their country honorably. Dismissed from the military because they were suffering from post-traumatic stress, these veterans were denied the benefits to which they were legally entitled. It took a historic class action lawsuit, Sable versus the United States, an effort spearheaded by NVLSP and pro bono counsel Morgan Lewis and Bacchius and Hewlett Packard Company to win their benefits and write a national. Let's watch the video. 